This broadcast is made possible by our 2020 Vision Partners. Hello, this is Bishop Clarence E. McClendon and welcome to A Miracle for You. I am excited because I know the word of the Lord is going to bring transformation and change in your life. I am literally declaring a prophetic word that's going to move you into your 2012. I ministered this message on 11, 11, 11. The Lord spoke to my spirit concerning the significance of that date and literally led me to some things that were woven into a prophetic word and it was profound. The impact on the people of God was decisive. It's going to be the same for you. Now you stay right there. Listen to this. Take it in. Receive it. The word of the Lord is coming to you right now. to see what is the significance of this month and this season and even this day in the Jewish calendar. Now, there are those of you that may not understand the distinction, but you understand that in the Jewish calendar, it is the month of Heshvan. And it is the year 5,772 of Heshvan in the Jewish calendar. In our Julian or Gregorian calendar, it is 2011, the year of our Lord. 2011. Are you still here? The Jews, because they do not acknowledge the Messiah having come, they do not gear their calendar by the advent or the incarnation of the Messiah, but by the creation of man. And according to the Jewish calendar, we are 5,772 years from Adam. Are, 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 you, are you still here? So November 11, 2011 is the 14th day of Heshvan, 5,772 on the Jewish calendar. Now according to Jewish historians, the year of Heshvan was the month of the flood of Noah. It is the only month in the Jewish calendar that has nothing special about it that we are told in Scripture. In other words, it has no holidays, no feasts, no fasts, no specific commands as to any specific observances. Therefore, the Jewish rabbis and Jewish historians believe it is the month set aside for God's revelation of the Messiah. Are you still here? Because it has no festival, it has no special celebration, and it is, the, it is the same, are you still here? It is the same month that the flood of Noah is recorded in which the judgment of the world was released and the righteous were saved. The Jews believe that the month of Heshvan is designated for the revelation of the Messiah because it is the only month in their calendar that does not have a festival. Now, you must understand, our calendar is a solar calendar. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, which is why if you follow the Jewish holidays, you'll find that the Jewish holidays do not occur on the same day in our calendar. They're on different days in our calendar, although it's the same day in their calendar. Because our calendar is solar, and it operates on about a 30 or 31 day interval. Theirs is lunar, and it operates on about a 29 day, 29 and a half day interval. Why is theirs lunar? Because according to creation, the evening and the morning were the first day. So the Jewish day starts at night. You didn't hear what I just said. Because they base their calendar on Scripture. Nudge your neighbor, say, this is quite educational as well as revelatory. Tell them that. <laughs> it is also recorded that this very day, the 14th of Heshbon, which is our 11-11-11, is the date of Rachel's death, giving birth to her final son, Benjamin which she called Benoni. Are you still here with me? Nudge your neighbor, say, now let's read Genesis 35. Because this is where the Spirit of the Lord directed me. Verse 16 of chapter 35 of Genesis, when you're there, say, I am. And the Word says, then they journeyed from Bethel. 
And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Let me clarify a few terms here. It says they journeyed from Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And when they were but a little distance to go to Ephrath, the word Ephrath in the Hebrew means fruitfulness or abundance. So there is a journey from the house of God or organized church to fruitfulness. Because just because you're religious doesn't mean you're fruitful. And there's a whole lot of people who are in church but have not yet come to a place where they are bearing kingdom fruit and inheriting the earth according to the design of Jehovah. Nobody's saying anything with me. So, 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 there's, so there's, they were in church, but they weren't fruitful. And there was a little ways to go to fruitfulness. Touch three people and tell them, you're almost there. Then they journeyed from the house of God, Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to fruitfulness and abundance, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Look at your neighbor and say, it's been rough. Now, it's very interesting here if you study the, the, the scripture that Ephrath, is the name that is given to what will later be called Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the place where David the king was born, a type of kingdom manifestation, and it is the place where Jesus the Messiah is born. Messianic anointing, kingdom authority, and a messianic anointing. Oh, God, they were just a little distance away from a true kingdom manifestation and a messianic revelation. <laughs> and Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had, somebody say hard. hard. Say it again, hard. Hard labor. Let me just read the rest of this and then I'll go back. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to fruitfulness and abundance. That is Bethlehem the place of messianic anointing and revelation. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Now again, the Jewish historians, I'm on my face. I'm not studying this stuff. I'm praying. God says, study the day. Notice the moment. Notice the hour. Look it up in the Jewish calendar. I'm on my face. He begins to point this out to me. And he says, this is the very day when the Hebrew historians say, that Rachel died in childbirth, and the Spirit of God said to me, this is the prophetic moment that I need you to announce. Now hear me. The Bible says God will do nothing in the earth except he first reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. A part of the prophetic function is to discern and understand what is on the mind of God so it can be declared in the earth. And whenever I say this, I point out the fact that it's not that the prophets themselves are so important. If the fact is God does nothing in the earth except he works with his word to do it. So if God is going to do anything in the earth, he's got to have somebody in the earth working with his word in order to get it done. How can they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So if God is getting ready to shift seasons, if God is prepared to release something fresh, he will reveal it to some prophet so they can declare it, so the people can hear it, so the people can declare it. Now nudge your neighbor and remind them, tell them God's word is never spoken 
merely to be heard. It is always spoken to be spoken. God never sends a word just for you to hear it. He sends a word so that when you hear it, you can speak it. I'm going to say that again because there's some of you that didn't get that. God never sends a word just so you can hear it. God sends a word so once you hear it, you can speak it. That's why he says in Isaiah 55, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall not return unto me void, but it will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Are you still here? I say, are you still here? But let's just read it. So shall my word be that goes forth around. It shall not return to me void. But if you go back up to verse 8, let me just read it here so the people can see it. Because I just said something that I need them to, to understand. Uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. In other words, God says, I'm not thinking what you're thinking. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And most people stop there, and they say, well, God's ways are so high, they're past finding out. Touch your neighbor and say, read the rest of it, man. <laughs> For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Verse 10. For, and it really should be but, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, does not return there, does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. Now let's check this out. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways higher than your ways. But just like the rain comes down and the snow comes down from heaven and waters the earth that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. In other words, my word comes down to bring you my thoughts and my word comes down to bring you my ways. Are you still here? But notice now, he says it comes down and it doesn't return on its own. But then he says, it shall not return unto him void. So wait a minute, God. If it doesn't return, how's it going to return? No, you missed it. You missed it. If it doesn't return, how's it going to return? You, you, you didn't hear it. If it doesn't return, how's it going to return? You just said, as the rain comes down in the snow from heaven and returns not, so shall my word be. So we say it doesn't return on its own. But then he says, <laughs> for as the rain comes down in the snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and butter that it may give seed to sow and bread for, to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return to me void. So wait a minute, I thought you just said it doesn't return. Now you say it doesn't return void. In other words, he's saying the power is when it returns. It's not when it comes to you. The power in the word is released when you return it to me. You're not hearing what I said. In other words, God said, I'm not sending you any word just so you can hear it. I'm sending you every word I send you so you can send it back to me. And on the return trip, it accomplishes. Oh, God, I need somebody to hear me. This is why in America we've got some of the greatest preachers in the earth, but less power than any church on the planet. Because our church service is entertainment. It's just hearing. We don't understand that every word that God sends to us, he's sending it to us so we can send it back to him. So when the prophet of God says there's a breakthrough coming in 30 days, you're supposed to go in your house and say there's a breakthrough. And because we don't understand this, prophets speak 
and nothing happens, and then we say the prophets were lying. When what we don't understand is we were to take that word, and just like Elisha, when he picked up Elijah's mantle, we're to strike the water with it and say, where is the God that that man of God talked about? Where is the promise? Lay your hand upon somebody and tell them you got to send this one back to him. Now look at your neighbor and tell him you got to send this back to him. And the moment you send it back to him, something's going to be released. My God, let me get to it. I'm running out of time. Are you still here? So the Lord begins to speak to me and he says, son, look up the significance of the number. Stay with me. Ten is the number which marks the perfection of divine order. Eleven is in addition to ten or the subverting or the undoing of that order. Twelve is the number which marks the perfection of divine government. Let me get it again. Ten is the number of perfection of divine order. There were some things in all of our lives that were completed in 2010. We didn't realize they were completed. Some stuff just came to an end, came to a halt, came to a stop. Are you listening to me? And God didn't explain to you what he was killing in your life. He just killed it and buried it. Are you still here? Ten is the number of completion of order. It's the completion. That's why 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 30, 40, completion. 11 is the number of the disruption of completion or the subverting or the undoing of completion. Are you still here? It is the number of chaos, disorder, and disruption, which is why your life for several months has been chaotic in disarray. The old prayer life you learn is not functioning at this level. I'm talking to somebody now. Your devotional discipline Seems like you can't get it together. You had a prayer life. You prayed at a regular time. You studied the word and everything was going. But in the last year or so, everything has gone kind of chaotic. You don't have time to pray. Your word time isn't the same. Feels like you're not getting things done. Touch three people and say chaos. chaos. Disorder. Chaos. Now you must understand something in, in, in any life. In any organism, in any organization, generally, you do not go from one stage of order to another stage of order. You go from a stage of order to a stage of chaos. You actually grow out of order. You actually increase out of order. And the season of your disarray is the season of the revelation of the principles of the foundation for the next order. You didn't hear what I just said. I'm going to say it again. So what happens is you grow out of order. And while you're trying to get things in order, God is revealing to you certain principles. You see, your life doesn't work anymore like this. So I want you to do this. And you're still trying to do this. And God shall know, you're, you're, when I'm taking you, you're not going to be able to do this. So I'm trying to get you. God, I... Lay your hand on somebody and tell them, you got to wake up. You got to wake up. Because you used to get up and you would pray from 8 to 9. But now you can't pray from 8 to 9 because stuff has shifted in your life. And God said, you know what? Now I want you to pray from 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. And because you're still trying to pray from 8 to 9. Because you never go from one stage of order to another stage of order. You always go from order 
to chaos to order. And in your chaos, you discover the principles that are the foundations for your next level of... <laughs> Stay with me. Stay with me. Yeah, yeah. Ten is the number of divine completion. Eleven is the number of chaos. <laughs> it's the number of disarray. The number 11 signifies disorder and judgment. It is used 24 times in the Bible. The designation 11th is used 19 times in the scripture. Are you still here? It is in Genesis chapter 11 where the rebellion of man is recorded, the construction of the Tower of Babel, where God judges and releases chaos. Which is why when people are talking and you can't understand it, we call it babbling. Are you still here? I said to the Lord, I said, God, help me to help the people understand this. He said, son, get it. You never move from one level of order to another level of order. You move from order to chaos to order. And in your chaos, you discover the principles of the next season of order. And he said 2011 for most Christians has been a year when they simply can't seem to get it together. They can't seem to line everything up. I got pieces. I got revelation. I know some stuff. I got a piece here and a piece there. But I'm missing this piece and that piece. And it seems like I can't do anything with the pieces I've got. If I'm preaching to you, just look at somebody and and say he's in my Kool-Aid. It is in the 11th year of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, that God executed his final judgment against Judah with the complete destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the exile of the remaining Jews in Babylon. The apostle John sees 11 things in connection with the final judgment in Revelation 20. 12 is the number of government. The number of of divine order it is the number of structure it is the number of rule are you still here I said are you still here which is why uh, in the creation there are th the Sun and the moon which rule the day and the night both have 12 hours because 12 is the number of rule and government and the completion of divine order. Your and my solar calendar operates on a 12-year month because it takes 300 and it, it takes that long for the earth to make a complete 360 degree completion revolution around the sun. Which is why your month is divided primarily into 30 or 31 days. Because 360 divided by 12 is 30. Somebody say 11. Yeah. Chaos. Yeah. Disarray. Yeah. 12. Yeah. Order. Yeah. Function. Look at your neighbor say 11. Yeah. 11. Yeah. 11. Yeah. 11, 11, 11 is chaos in all three dimensions. Spirit, chaos. Soul, chaos. Body, chaos. But it's also six ones. Six is the number of man. One is the number of newness. So 11, 11, 11, chaos in all three dimensions. But God is also getting ready to release a newness into the life of every man, woman, boy, and girl that is named by his name, touch three people and say he's almost done. You know, I don't know how many times and how many people in this last season I have come in contact with or have come to me and said, Bishop McClendon, this has been one of the most challenging, one of the most difficult years of my life. I want you to hear me now because just like I declared in this word, uh, the Bible says it was when Rachel had but a little way to go to Ephrath, a little way to go to this next place, that the childbirth, she labored in childbirth. And many of you have been laboring with that which is getting ready to come forth in your life. So I wanna encourage you today that the worst of it really is over. And uh, if you're listening to my voice right now, you have qualified to come in 
to a brand new dimension in God. I want to pray with you if you've never accepted Christ Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. All the challenge, all the difficulty in your life, I want you to hear me, that God has already forgiven your sin, that He is holding nothing against you. And right now, I'm talking to you, sir, right now is the time to get your life right with God because there is a wave that's about to hit and you want to be in because the goodness of God is getting ready to overtake multitudes of people and you are a part of it. I want you to pray with me right now. Say, come into my life, Lord Jesus. Just repeat it. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. I receive you now as my Savior and my Lord. I admit it's been tough, but I receive you now and I declare my best days are ahead of me. In Jesus' name, I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Thanks for dying for my sins and being raised for my liberty. In Jesus' name, I am free. Now listen to me. If you prayed that prayer, salvation has just come to your life, to your house. I want you to write me. I want you to get on the website, uh, bishopmcclendon.com. Let me know that you prayed with me. I want to come into agreement with you and pray for your life, for your future. I believe the best is yet to come. Now listen to me. Many of you, uh, you watch the broadcast, you share with us uh, week after week. I want you, as we come to the close of this year, to sow a seed into this ministry to help us with the things that we're doing for God. No gift is too large. No gift is too small. I was impressed to just share. There's some of you, you just need to send a dollar for every month this year that God has blessed you. A $12 seed, not much, but I believe that God will honor that seed of thanksgiving. This is Bishop McClendon. I'll be right here next week with a miracle.